Welcome to Cowboys. This week we're going to talk about the most important, the most sacred thing a cowboy owns, his hat. Now you can tell a lot about a cowboy from the cut of his hat, where he's from, what kind of work he does, what he's all about. I guess I could be in trouble. Get ready to learn the most intimate secrets of the most important part of a cowboy's wardrobe, because you are what's on your head. Rich, was there actually a first cowboy hat? First manufactured processed hat was the Boss of the Plains, which was a natural beaver hat, had natural color, and it, it was just open crowns and flat brims so the cowboy could shape it and personalize it himself. Hmm. Well, the regionality of hats would be different from my home state of Texas as in your home state of Montana. What are the, some of the differences that we would see in that stretch? There's so much personality in those hats because what they've done is they've taken the regionality of a hat and some of the traditions that, that came up through history and they've applied it to uh, how hot it is where you live, how rainy it is where you live. So some of those hats have bigger brims or the sides are higher or the crowns are taller. And sometimes they can't even wear a dark color because it's so hot where they live, see? And so there, you, you can always pick a, a person sometimes by like the big loop style, the Nevada style, they even have special uh, spur straps that they used to wear in Southern California because the, the Vaquero had an influence down there. So they all have real personalities and they all are regional. Well, who were some of the personalities of the late 1800s that maybe had some input into the design or trends of cowboy hats? Well, you know, Buffalo Bill Cody was an inspiration to everybody because he had his Wild West show on the road. And so you saw a lot of those open crown hats in the gunfighter style and that stuff that they used then. And they would pinch the crown down and, and make it in a circle called a telescope crease. And then they would leave it open and they would just pinch it together like you've got on your hat because that's the way they grabbed the hat. And that was the personality of the hat. And then they came out with bigger brimmed hats that had a big influence in, in the style that went, was almost a costume for them. And Buffalo Bill Cody wore those as some of the gunfighters did. You, you had a Tom Horn who was an influence he was a tracker and, and a gunfighter in, in the United States. And some of the other people that are now famous, that, that weren't so famous then, but they established a lifestyle uh, for the people that they had in their influence at the time. Rich cowboy hats tend to continuously evolve from Tom Mix up through the urban cowboy. Well, they're easily influenced by the media because we have such a media exposure these days. And so when you get, you get some of the traditionalists they're going back in history and reviving some of those old styles, but otherwise we see, you know, the George Straits, the urban cowboy trends and stuff that sometimes it's not all positive in the industry, in the fashion industry, but you have to remember that the stable lifestyles of the cowboy industry in the Western industry, it's not just a, a, a lifestyle, it's a way of life for these people. And so they have a hat that is functional and they wear it for many years. Now, the book you wrote is the Encyclopedia of Cowboy Hats. and You start at the very beginning and go all the way through. How many different shapes, designs of, of hats have been uh, since the 1800s? Well, there's, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands. But you have to remember that it's maybe a, just a twist and a turn that gives it a little personality because you can take any of those hats and add a, a different personal trim ribbon, a wider ribbon, a roll on the edge, a hand curl. You can raise or lower the crown. You can manipulate those things to suit each person's lifestyle or their body height and weight. History repeats itself and the, and the Wild West is still alive here today. Well, we may not go back to the pirate hats, <laughs> but other than that, we're still, we're still going strong in traditional lifestyles and hats that are functional and they're reviving all that stuff. What was your decision in picking that hat? I'll tell you, Rich, when I joined SAS 11 years ago, I went down to Tonto Rim in Seymour, Indiana, and the only hat he had in my size was this Tom Mixtessin, seven and three quarters. I had to have it. 
I, uh, I was a deputy sheriff in Yavapai County in Prescott, Arizona in 1964, and they required a hat similar to this, and that's when I bought this Stetson. Bat Masterson had several pictures taken in his lifetime. All of them, with the exception of one, he was wearing this hat, or some variation of the same hat. My grandmother was from Sonora. They had a large uh, horse ranch down there in 1910. And in the revolution, they lost it. Uh, moved to uh, San Diego, and this reminded me of sort of my family's heritage. The fellers in Second Cab, we was heading up to Montana territory. We was passing through a little place called Cody. We got caught in a gully washer, and I lost my kepi. Well, there was a haberdasher over there, and he had this very fine chapeau there. Well, I purchased it. I figured it looked real good. Another feller had one of the regimental insignias. I got to tell you, that insignia, that is for the 2nd U.S. Cavalry, which is the longest consecutively serving regiment in existence today. About 1875, John B. Stetson really took that hat, and, and he helped uh, form that huge brim in a little hole in the ground. They used to take beaver fur, and they would spin that fur, and they could take anything and dye it black. And that's called a kettle curl. I don't know yeah. if you know that that's around right. the edge. That's, yeah. That kettle curl on the edge, it made it so that the rain could uh, run off the edge, actually. But what happens was that the ribbon would put tension on the edge so that they could beat the hat up more. And then they used a wide ribbon on it, and the wide ribbon on the crown was to help put tension and hold the size. So the cowboys had all these time on their hands around cow camp and they'd sit around and they'd braid their little stampede strings and they'd pull their horse's tail and they'd put extra hat bands on the hat and then they'd take it and they'd dunk it in a horse trough and they would re-roll that edge and put that little gunfighter crease on it and they'd go back on the trail. We do some hats sometimes and we put that sweat on there artificially but that hat came on there naturally. This is all natural. Yeah. That's called a hash knife crease. I don't know if you know how you got that crease in there, but they used to get it from just grabbing it and they would squish it down a little bit with their fingers, you know. And then you've got a nice mule kick in the back of it and they used to get that dent in there because they would set their hat down, it would get crushed and it'd get a little dent in it, you know. It's kind of like the old bar crease from hitting the bar too many oh, yeah. times. But those are hand curls that you've got. It's a great way of showing personality from where you're, you've grabbed it all the time. And that's made out of bleached beaver fur, especially when you bought it. They used to take beaver fur felt in the 60s and they would spin it and then they would bleach it. And it would come out in that great color that you have. And then you've added a lot of personality to it. You've got a, a, a nice braided band that added personality to it. The only thing we're not quite sure about is that maybe uh, we should uh, take some of that personality out of it to get the odor. What do you think? <laughs> the bowlers themselves, uh, when they came out west, they used that narrow brim bowler for several reasons. And one of them was because it had a three inch brim, it gave them sun protection. The other thing was that they used to have a little nap to them. They could actually take the beaver fur and form it on a mold. And then when they rolled the edge, they would put that little ribbon on the edge and that ribbon made it withstand all the weather and the abuse that, that they gave out and dished out to it in their everyday life. And the last thing that a lot of people didn't know was when people used those bowlers and they could actually swing a different loop when they were chasing cows because the hat never caught on the loop. And a bigger brimmed hat, they always had trouble with that. But Bat Masterson had a wonderful influence in the West because he was a, a, a headliner in, in the comic books and in the, in the Old West because of his attire. And it, it came from Europe originally, but you know, he, uh, he signified a, a certain dress gentleman affair that, the, that was not typically associated with the Old West. They used to take the stampede strings and they would also use their horses' tails and they would, in, in a, they would do a mule tail out of, the, out of the stampede string. So they'd braid the leather, they'd use the horses' tails, then they'd use some of the hide in some of the hair on hide sometimes in adorning the hats. The hat itself is made out of what they call grizzly beard.